Okay, we're going to convene the hearing section in one minute. <laughs> Okay, good morning everyone. We're going to convene the hearing section uh, to order. I'm Terry Stockwell, the chair of the section. Um, I'd like to welcome Steve Heinz uh, from the great state of New York to the table. And uh, one general announcement is that meeting specific proxies cannot vote on final actions. We have one today. Um, so uh, approve the agenda. I will note that under uh, item number five, uh, there will be a report from the AP. Are there, are, are there any other edits or, or changes to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. Um, are there any comments or edits to the proceedings from the our meeting on August 2015? Seeing none, I'll consider the, uh, the proceedings approved. Are there are no public comments uh, uh, are the, that were listed. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment on items that are not on the agenda? Seeing not, uh, we're going to move right into the 2016-2018 uh, hearing specs and turn it over to Ashton. Good morning. So uh, we will move into the 2016 through 2018 specifications for the Atlantic herring fishery. Next slide. Okay, so we'll just keep moving. So uh, based on the 2015 operational assessment, uh, herring is, the herring stock was rebuilt and overfishing is not occurring. So given this, this uh, information, the SSC recommended a, an acceptable biological catch of 111,000 metric tons. Okay. Oh, there it is. Uh, and the probability of overfishing is 50% in year three. There's a 0% probability of overfishing for the stock um, over the overall three years. Next, next slide. So now you'll just see the table that is the, um, the New England Fisheries Management Council's recommended specifications. Uh, it includes, as it aligns with the SSC's recommended ABC of 111,000 metric tons, which is a modest decrease from the previous uh, ABC. The management uncertainty is set at 6,200 metric tons, and this was also um, in the 2015 fishing year, and it represents the, the catch from the new Brunswick Weir fishery. Uh, the, man, uh, the stock wide annual catch limit, which represents the difference between the ABC and the management uncertainty, is set at 104,800 metric tons. There is status quo allocations and seasonal splits um, in Area 1A. 100% of the sub-allocation is allotted for June through December in this, in this uh, design. And the status quo is for 3% research set-aside, and the fixed gear set-aside is also at 295 metric tons. Next slide. Uh, there was an option that the council voted on, and this option is for the New Brunswick Weir fishery payback. So if, uh, con if, consider if landings through October 1st are less than 4,000 metric tons out of that 6,200 allotted metric tons, um, the NIMS can uh, allocate an additional 1,000 metric tons back to the Area 1A fishery. Um, and this would kind of raise the ACL to 105,800 metric tons if it is, um, if it is allotted for that year. So that was that was approved by the council or recommended by the council. And just as a reminder for the 2015 area one seasonal allocations um, for trimester two, we also have 0% um, quota for trimester or trimester two. We have June 1st through September 30th, 72.8% of the quota. Trimester three from October through December is 27.2% uh, of the quota. And area one will close when 92% of the total sub ACL has been harvested. Uh, next slide. So those are just a quick review of the specifications that were voted on at the council and that we will ask for you to, guys to discuss today. Questions, Richie, then, then Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, question on the re research set aside. Um, I remember last year when we were at this meeting and there was calls about boats out fishing after 1A had closed and it was the research set aside and evidently some states were not uh, informed about that. So I, the, the question is, are, what is the involvement in the states with that research set aside? And, and do, do we have any decisions? in the process and are we informed when it's uh, being implemented? 
Sure, I'm going to have, help Ashton out a little bit. The uh, news that we got last year at this very same time was in reference to the uh, two-year RSA, which was the 2014 and 2015 RSA program. The, the, if the council approved and if this commission approves an RSA for the next three-year spec package, it, it will go out. Uh, it, uh, for, you know, it goes out into an open bid, and um, we we do not participate in the review of, of the uh, bids that come in. Follow up. Richie. So, so will there be any harvest this year then under RSA? It will begin, uh, the, well, I guess the uh, Area 1A will officially close in 55 minutes, um, and RSA uh, 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 landings will be able to continue until our RSA is, is taken between now and the end of the calendar year. And, and again, the, as far as the notification, I'm asking this because I have uh, some of my constituents say, uh, lobstermen, you know, are wondering, okay, is this the end of the, you know, of the fishing in the area where they have lobster here, or will it uh, start up again? And, uh, you know, how do I answer that? Uh, each each of the states have uh, landing agreements with the uh, with the with the vessels and with SMAST, who is a contractor for the RSA. And part of the um, part of the agreement is for the states to be notified. So um, it will be up. I mean, certainly, you know, I can only speak for Maine. Um, you know, our, our landing permits were, are will, are distributed to our Marine Patrol, and we, we distribute that information to the fishermen. I'm sure that Doug has some sort of uh, similar pro program and. David as well, so. Pat. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could you please go back a couple of slides where you had said that uh, NIMS was going to, uh, no, back again, that one there, no, nope, that one. Um, less than 4,000 metric tons have been caught. They're going to allocate an additional 1,000 metric tons. Um, is that just an arbitrary number, or what is that going to do? And why, why couldn't they have more? Maybe it's a dumb question, but uh, 4,000 versus 1,000. I'm slowly remembering back to yeah, the... Yeah, I, I thought we would ask them. To, ...to the hearing committee meeting. Uh, I think that that was because they weren't sure how much, how because of the the delay in kind of landings reports that they wanted to be more conservative. And they thought a thousand metric tons was was being conservative, but also allowing enough to be put back since they weren't always um, using the allotted amount every year. Thank you. It just seems unusual that if you have 4,000 metric ton available, they're going to allow only 1,000 metric, metric ton. Why couldn't they not increase to four? Uh, particularly, in fact, that that's a, uh, I think that's a very uh, aggressive fishery, and they probably could sell it all. I think you could tell me about that. But I think we need that question answered. I'd almost suggest why could they not go ahead and increase it maybe to 2,500 or even 3,000. Doug, you want to address that as, as the happy new ex-hearing chair? Well, I came in halfway through your discussion but because uh, uh, I was uh, having another sidebar here. But um, the, the concern here is this is our... Um, 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 the change in the uh, the ACL, the change between the APC and the ACL to account for management uncertainty, and there was concern on the the part of uh, the council um, that we not cut this too close, um, because we really don't know the New Brunswick weir fishery has not been uh, landing uh, in re very recent years that many. Uh, uh, very small poundage level of it, of what they had historically looked, but it could go back. And so our, our concern here was we wanted to make sure that there was um, enough um, difference between the ABC and the a ACL to take into consideration that, that little buffer of, of how much they were going to land. Um, they have landed, you know, tens of thousands of pounds going back 10 years ago, but... 
Well, again, it just seemed like an, a lost opportunity, uh, particularly in view of the status of the stock. And uh, it seems like it almost, not being arbitrary about it, but it's almost an arbitrary number. And we think it might, or we think they might. So I just, if I were, were a fisherman, I would probably get up at arms and say, why not more? And again, if we're doing it for um, safety measures and ensuring that we don't catch more than we should at this particular point in time, that's it. But again, I think that jumps right out at you and says, golly, gee whiz, we could go to four. You're giving me a thousand. So, just a question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Pat. Are there other questions for Ashton? Seeing none, I think uh, there, we should divide her presentation into two motions. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I have a motion for uh, to move to approve the 2016 to 2018 Atlantic herring specifications as recommended by the New England Fisheries Management Council. And then I'll have a follow-up motion addressing 1A specifically. Thank you, Doug. Is there a second by Mark Gibson? Is there a discussion on the motion on the board? Bill. Uh, you are a taskmaster. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just had a, uh, reading this over, are we, are we talking about a reduction in the quotas overall here on this page 10 that I'm looking at? Is that a reduction from this year going forward? And if so, why? It's, it's a slight reduction. Um, I'm not, I mean, my, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's around 11,000 tons per year, but it's, it's um, on a three-year three -year specification pro process because of the projections that came out of the most recent stock assessment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've just Jeff just sidebar me is is down from uh, 114 to 111. Uh, other other oh, David. This this uh, uh, this is a very quick point, Mr. Chairman. I, I can uh, support the motion. I think it's logical, but I, I would just flag is a uh, issue for the commission. The way that this system works is uh, the, the Canadian catch essentially comes off the top. Uh, and uh, this has always been the way that we've handled uh, this issue. So embedded in this process uh, is this system where uh, the, if the Canadians go back to harvesting uh, the resource that they traditionally harvest, they have harvested as much as 40,000 metric tons in the New Brunswick weir fishery. Uh, the the sub-ACL for um, area one would be zero if they went back to it. Their long-term catch is 18,000 tons. Their catch last year was about 2,000 tons. So as Doug correctly pointed out, they're at the low end of their, at their range, but they, there's nothing that inhibits them from going back. So my, the only reason I raise this, I think we really need to, at some point, and it would probably be fall on the hand, in the hands of the New England Council, is get some discussions on some kind of sharing arrangement so that that doesn't happen. Thank you. David, David Pierce. Yeah, th thank you to that point. That's been a long-standing concern of mine regarding what the Canadians might take, and we give them whatever we think they might take, and there's no other alternative to that. It's with mackerel, it's with uh, sea herring, and yes, indeed, there have been some discussions in previous years, even recently, that maybe we need some understanding with the Canadians as to how we should share this resource, especially if suddenly their catch uh, in the fixed gear fishery uh, spikes up for whatever reason. Uh, but my understanding is that the Canadians are not interested in any sort of discussion. So as it stands, it's what it is. And the National Marine Fisheries Service will continue to be obliged 
um, I guess obliged is the right word, to subtract off whatever we think the Canadians will catch. Um, so it penalizes the U.S. industry, and there's no consequence uh, for the Canadians. Fortunately, we've been lucky relative to what they have been projected to take and what they've actually taken. And all we can do now is keep our fingers crossed that they don't have a catch. It's of significance because once it happens, then our U.S. industry uh, will be, in 1A notably, will be dramatically impacted. Uh, dramatically impacted, be it sea herring or, or mackerel. There's nothing we can do at the ASMFC level. We can continue to work on it uh, at the council level, but again, the, uh, unless there's been a change of heart by the Canadians, um, there's no, you know, there'll be no understanding, no sharing. Other comments, motion on the board. Seeing none, uh, short caucus, and then we will move move the question. Everybody ready? Those who support the motion on the board, please indicate so. And that would be unanimous. Um, seven, uh, seven, zero, zero. Uh, Doug? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And here's my follow-up motion for Area 1A. Uh, it's moved to allocate the 2016 Area 1A tax seasonally with a 72.8% available from June through September and 27.2% allocated from October through December. The fishery will close when 92% of the seasonal period quota has been harvested and under from June through September may be rolled into the October through December period. Motion made by Doug Grout. Is there a second? Second by Bill Adler. If this motion looks familiar, it's because it's the same one we've supported the last at least two years in a row. Uh, is there any uh, discussion from the section? Seeing none, is there any need to caucus? Seeing none, those support the motion on the board, please indicate so. Tony, you want this is, Terry, this is final action, so it either needs to be a roll call vote or if there's no objection, then your roll call is done automatically. Okay, thank you for the correction. Is there an objection to the to the motion on the board? Seeing none, the the, the motion carries. What's that, Joe? Okay, thank you. Uh, we're, we're moving on to the next agenda item, which is the consideration of draft amendment three for public comments. Is this an action item, Richie? Uh, before we move on, um, uh, I don't think I was clear in my question about the RSA. Um, because Doug informed me that the states are informed about landing, but um, we're not informed about fishing. And that, that's my concern. I have constituents that remove lobster gear uh, to prepare for the midwater trawlers when 1A opens after the spawning closure, and then they want to put it back out. And they're, so the question is, you know, will they see midwater boats in again? Or, and if so, when and what boats? So that, that's, that's the concern. Will the states have any more detailed information about when the RSA will be fished, by whom and when? I'm going to defer your answer to uh, Jeff Kalen, whose company participates in the RSA. Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to members of the section. Um, yeah, the, uh, this year again, um, we're going to go into the Gulf of Maine and, and take the RSA. That's already started, I think, Richie. Uh, there should be a better communication to the states from Brad and the, and the uh, shoreside monitoring people. Those, those, they're the ones who we communicate to get started. Um, we did agree to stay out of the cod spawning area that Dr. Pierce identified last year. 
again this year, and those charts are going out to the fleet right now. The companies involved um, have agreed to share up the cost of that fish, and we're buying it ahead of time now. I think we we're, each of us have been allocated something like 174,000 tons or something like that out of that 3% RSA, and that fishing is beginning right now. And I think we're optimistic that we'll find mackerel again like we did last year. So if there is a deficit in communication, um, we, we really need to make sure that, that the shoreside monitoring people are giving you the information that you need. So I think, you know, we are going to fish and, and hopefully avoid gear conflicts. But uh, everybody's, I think we're already in there fishing, Richie, right now. Thank you. You'll follow up, Richie, or I'll set. Okay, all right, David. Yeah, just just one quick one clarification. Uh, the boats are not exempt from the spawning closure. They're exempt from the the days uh, the days uh, for fishing or landing that is, but not from the spawning closure. The spawning, however, the spawning closure uh, did expire. I think November second today. So it's not really a didn't play a role this year. It could in, it could in, uh, in other years, but uh, not this year. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Seeing not, we're moving on to uh, draft amendment three. Ashton. Okay. I'm going to review the, um, the options for draft amendment three. Uh, these are revised options that you guys have seen previously, and they should be, and I provided them in the supplemental material. Next slide. So the guidance that the PDT received um, at the August board meeting was to, to develop options to protect spawning fish by prohibiting the landing of Atlantic herring caught within specific spawning areas. The PDT used this um, to develop specifically the issue one spawning area efficacy options to revise them. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to just review issue one, spawning area efficacy options, the new and revised options. Uh, issue two, fixed gear set aside provision adjustment. There were no revisions made to, the, to this, uh, to the one option in there. Issue three, empty fish hold provision. There are new options, uh, new options within this category. Next slide. Okay, so section 2.1, spawning area closure monitor monitoring system, corresponds to the technical aspect of when to issue a spawning area closure. It's based on the female gonadal somatic index, commonly known as GSI. The current system leaves room for improvement and it was because it was developed in the 90s with limited data to develop the critical parameters. Uh, so therefore, the PDT analyzed over 10 years worth of GSI data and noticed that there is variability in the onset of spawning from year to year. So to minimize timing concerns, an updated GSI system was developed by the PDT. It was designed to pick up on the interannual differences to identify if it is going to be an early or a late year and close the fishery appropriately, also relying less heavily on default dates. So as you'll see on here, we have option A, uh, status quo. So just in summary, um, currently we get two consecutive samples um, consisting of 100 adult female fish within seven days, and uh, they're put into separate two separate size bins, and GSI is analyzed, and that would trigger a spawning area closure. Um, Option B is the status quo with adjustments. So on here, we kind of moved it initially in the status quo, it says commercial catch samples. We um, extended that to not only include commercial catch, but also fishery independent samples as well. So it's fishery independent and dependent samples would be allowed for this program just to provide um, state biologists with uh, the best access for data. It's not to say that we would move over to independent samples, it's just to say that if they're available, then that would be helpful for them to use. Um, option B also says the fishery will remain open if sufficient samples are available, but they do not contain female herring and INC ICNF gonadal sages three through five. The PDT would like to draw um, some caution to this option, specifically because since we don't have a herring independent sampling program, um, there might be instances where the default date this would negate the default dates, and therefore the, um, certain spawning areas would not close. 
Option C is a GSI 30 based forecast system. So this is the updated system that I previously talked about. Um, it was presented also, a technical report was presented earlier this year about it. So originally it was thought that the different size classes um, of fish have different maximum GSIs for spawning, which is why we in the status quo have two separate size bins. After review of the data, it appears that that is not the case. The PET found that regardless of size, all herring have, maxim have the similar maximum GSI. So the, uh, it provides evidence that the average size of herring decreases as the spawning season progresses, meaning that larger fish spawn first. So the system uh, standardizes to a 30 centimeter fish, which is a larger fish. So therefore, a, a spawning area closure would be initiated based on when larger fish spawn first, because they spawn first, that's when the closure would start. Um, it would be based on a minimum of three samples, each containing at least 25 female herring and I ICNAF gonadal stages three through five. Once the forecasted date, closure date is within five days, the spawning closure will be announced. <coughs> Next slide. So default closure dates. So right now uh, we have option A is a status quo. If we do not have sufficient samples to close the fishery, meaning we don't have um, samples that include adult sized female fish, or if there's not vessels fishing in a spawning area closure, um, then default dates would apply. So Eastern Maine is August 15th, uh, Western Maine September 1st, uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire September 21st. So going, so the next option is option B with three sub-options, and this relates back to the, the forecasting system that I just talked about. So now they've developed trigger values um, associated with it. So we have three. The first one is a 70th percentile GSI 30 trigger value of 23. This closes the fishery at an earlier date to provide more protection for maturing fish. If default dates were needed, although hopefully we don't think that the PDT does not think that they would be needed considering we're looking at how fish mature using this forecasting date, but if they were needed, um, Eastern Maine would close on August 28th, Western Maine on September 21st, uh, Mass New Hampshire September 21st, and if a tri-state option, which I'll present next, it would also be September 25th, September 25th for all. Um, and the median trigger dates were calculated for the period 2004 through 2013 using the formula and trigger values that were described in the GSI 30 forecast system. So the 80th percentile trigger value would close the fishery. Oops, it would close the fishery um, at later stages, later stages of maturity, but prior to spawning. The 90th percentile closes the fishery just prior to spawning. So as you kind of evaluate these options, just go back one slide. As you evaluate these options, sub so option B, one, two, and three, it's kind of based on the sections. Um, the amount of risk they want to put in this. If they want to close the fishery and make sure that, that the fishery is closed, when spawning starts in the 70th percentile option would be more appropriate. If they want to start it just prior to spawning, then it, then it would be the 90th percentile option. Uh, next slide. So the spawning area boundaries. So right now we have the status quo and I have a map up there to show that there's three spawning area boundaries, Eastern Maine, Western Maine, and Mass New Hampshire. Um, there is uh, the PDT analyzed actually combining the Western Maine and Massachusetts New Hampshire spawning areas. Um, just looking at the data, the GSI data that they calculated for over 10 years, they show that there is no significant difference in spawning times um, for these two areas, so why not combine them? It would also increase uh, the amount of sampling that we could do in one area as well. Next slide. So, so 2.4 spawning closure period. So as we know for option A, it's status quo four weeks. Um, however, for there's another option that the PDT um, has presented, which is option B, six weeks. So based on a literature review, um, they felt that six weeks is appropriate. And if you, other fisheries actually see longer spawning periods up to eight weeks. Um, but however, locally six weeks um, seems to be the signal that comes through the strongest. So they're recommending a six week closure period. Um, next slide. So this kind of relates to the closure period and this is the, the reclosure. So for status quo, we have sampling for two weeks and after an area is reopened, uh, then the area is, uh, they're sampling for two weeks after the area is reopened to see if there's spawning fish in the catch. So if a sample comes up, there's 25% or more um, spawning herring, then the fishery would close for another two weeks. <laughs> It's, it's rather vague how it's written. So there's option B, a more of a defined protocol. So this would involve, um, well, let me just actually read it specifically just to make sure I have. 
I don't want to paraphrase this one. Um, sampling will resume in the final week of the initial closure period or at the end of the initial closure period. If one sample taken from a within a spawning closure area by Maine, New Hampshire, or Massachusetts indicates significant numbers of spawn, a spawn herring, then closures will resume for an additional two weeks. Significant numbers of herring is defined as 25% or more mature herring by number in a sample that have yet to spawn. Mature or spawn herring are defined as uh, gonadal stages five and six, and a sample is defined as a minimum of 100 randomly selected adult-sized fish from a fishery dependent or independent source. So it just kind of puts a little bit more parameters around um, the reclosure period. Option C is a no reclosure protocol, and I would uh, like to note on here, this option would only be considered if it was linked back to the initial six week closure. So we wouldn't recommend um, a, a no reclosure protocol if there was a four, if we were to main, remain status quo with a four week closure. So moving on from spawning area efficacy, we'll move into the next option, which is a fixed gear set aside provision. So status quo, the fixed gear set aside is available to fixed gear fishermen until November 1st. If unused, then it's rolled, um, if unused, then it's made available to the remainder of the herring fleet. So there is an option B, which would just remove the rollover provision. The fixed gear fishermen retain the set aside throughout the entire calendar year. So we developed a, a graph just to kind of show uh, fixed gear landings after the rollover period. And as you can see, there has been zero landings going back to 2004 and then November to December period. Next slide. So this is the last issue, uh, and this is the empty fish hold provision. So currently, the interstate and federal FMPs do not require an empty fish hold provision prior to departing the dock. There, there's concern that unsold herring are being dumped at sea if there's not enough market demand. Therefore, the intent of this provision is to encourage less wasteful fishing practices by creating an incentive to catch amounts of herring as demanded by markets. Um, the council included a complementary provision in framework four. So option A is status quo, no empty fish hold provision. And there is no requirement for the empty vessels, empty vessel holds of fish prior to a fishing departure. Option B, uh, and I will read this one um, in its entirety. This option will require the fish holds on category A and B Atlantic carrying vessels are empty of fish before leaving the dock on any trip when declared into the Atlantic carrying fishery. A waiver may be issued for instances when there are fish in the hold after inspection by an appropriate law enforcement officer. Only vessels departing on a fishing trip <coughs> that are required to hold empty vessels of fish. As such, waivers would not be required for vessels transporting from, uh, fish from dock to dock. Uh, I will note that this option is contingent on federal adoption. So this, there should, it should be out any day now whether or not this is approved. Um, so if it was approved, then, then we would move forward with it. Option C is basically exactly what I read, except that it's narrowed down to only boats that are pumping fish. Also contingent on federal adoption. Option D and E are new, they, uh, and these are to say that if there is not federal adoption, then we would still move forward with it, and the states would have to implement these management programs as well. And that is it. Moving on to the next slide. So there are questions. Thank you, Ashton. I do want to remind this section that these new options are the result of our request for further development of this uh, amendment in, in August. And these are not final action items. Um, they're, they're not preferred alternatives, and they will be going out for public comment. So questions first before we go to the AP report. Doug. Um, the first question I have, if you bring back up the last slide, um, I'm assuming there's A and B vessels that don't pump, and that's why we had that in there. But does that mean that they, the vessels that don't pump will be able to go out uh, and leave uh, the dock with um, herring still in their fish hold that may not have been accounted for? For options C and E? Yes. Yes. And doesn't that defeat the purpose of having the empty fish hold? If they, I guess I'm wondering what drove um, giving an exemption to uh, vessels that do not uh, pump the ability to uh, go out and discard fish that haven't been accounted for. Let me answer that. 
Yeah, uh, Doug, I'm, before I turn it over to Eric, I think is this was specific to the uh, request from uh, uh, C Freeze concerning the freezer trawlers and keeping frozen product on board. But Eric, is that is am I correct in that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, actually, it's a double-edged sword, I suppose. Uh, initially, yes, it, it, it that is correct. Frozen, you know, we have freezer vessels that freeze product and. <laughs> When they're fishing in Narragansett Bay, they may come back to the dock with, you know, not enough to bother unloading because of the expense of unloading 300 tons or 400 tons at a whack. Um, and they, that product remains in the boat until the boat is full. Uh, we also have uh, smaller boats who fish, uh, you know, in the wintertime, of course, from Point Judith or in Rhode Island in general, and I'm sure it probably happens other places where they may fish for a truckload. We're going to send a truckload of bait to Maine, and they may have, uh, instead of having a truckload of 40,000, they may have 50,000, or they may have 20,000 pounds for any given day, uh, in which case they would uh, fish a second day for that truck. They're not discarding anything at sea. The fish are actually accounted in the market, but perhaps not at the day that they are at landed the first time. Uh, you know, if they have 50,000, you blow a truckload uh, up the road uh, for 40, and you leave a 10 in the boat, and the next day you go catch another truck, but you have 10 to start with. Uh, I think the whole thing started because there was some activity for, for some larger vessels who had product that they could not sell, and they went offshore and then discarded with the use of their onboard fish pumps, and uh, that does nobody any good. So it, it was just a, a provision to take into account uh, the actual fishing practices uh, uh, that happened uh, in, in my area, and I can assure you that there is, I won't say none, because there may be a few, you know, 100 pounds or something like that that are discarded at sea, but in general, 100% of the catch is counted for at market. Doug. So a follow up to that, and then I have a couple more questions, but uh, I would then ask that the PDT um, uh, uh, clarify and put this, that, those concerns in the analysis as to the reasons, uh, reasons that these options are in, yeah, to try and address those specific things and make sure that those are included um, in the final document that we send out for public hearing. Uh, it's important that we have the analysis and just not put an option out there without a reason that we're putting in an exemption for that. Um, the second thing is just in a couple of places here in the document, um, we talk about samples. Uh, uh, and it's in the default, in, in some places, it's very clear what a sample is. It's 100 fish. Um, it's, for example, under B, status quo adjustments under 2.1, um, it says sufficient sample, sufficient sample information shall mean at least two samples of 100 fish. When we get down to the GSI, um, it says we're going to have three um, fisheries dependent samples, but it doesn't say 100 fish. Are we talking 100 fish consistent throughout this uh, document? No. No. So no. this could be any size? Yeah, I think when it, in, discuss, in discussions with the PDT, they didn't want to say that you had to have 100 fish. They just wanted to make sure that they had enough fish, which they categorized as, which we categorize as 25 female herring. So it's, it's not to say that there has to be a specific sample size. There just needs to be a specific type of fish. It doesn't, there could be any amount of sample, but we just need the 20, we need at least 25. What under C it says, uh, based on a minimum of three fisheries dependent or independent samples, each containing at least 25 female herring. Um, so what you're looking for is those 25 female herring in gonadal stages uh, three through five. Correct. Um, it doesn't make any difference. It could be um, a thousand fish that they're going to look through. That's correct. So when you go to the dock, how do you tell your port side samplers 
how many fish to catch, how many fish to sample. Are they supposed to go through every one until they get 25 fish? Is that what they're looking for? In discussions with the PDT, the, the initial thinking was that they would tell the port side samplers to collect 50 fish. Okay. Then uh, the same thing, question applies all the way down into the reopening uh, scenarios. Uh, it talks about one sample, and again, is that a sample under option B, defined protocol for reopening. Uh, if one sample taken from the area, it could be any size, any number of fish. No, that one, it goes back to more of the status quo, which it would be a minimum of 100 randomly okay. selected adult sized fish. It might be uh, helpful to clarify that in the document, um, that at least in this particular case, we're talking about one sample of uh, 100 fish. For option B, yeah. the defined protocol, we have in there samples defined as a minimum of 100 randomly selected adult sized fish from a fishery dependent or independent source. You're correct. Thank you for pointing that out to me. You're welcome. Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, under the situation of the, uh, of the uh, trawler freezing catch, wouldn't that be uh, processed? I mean, wouldn't that be defined as a processed fish if it's free, if it's frozen and, and in boxes? And wouldn't that be treated differently than fish that hadn't been processed? I think that would have to be clarified in the document. I mean, Eric, Eric had previously commented that, at least from the sea freeze perspective, some of their fish was not frozen, it was just held on board. Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm not saying that they're necessarily some fresh and some frozen. What I'm saying is there's no intention to discard anything that we've already spent the, the effort catching. Uh, in most cases, the product is frozen at sea, uh, and we're just trying to use economies of scale. We don't want to take out 30 tons or 50 tons every time we come to the dock. We'd rather fill the boat and take out the full boatload at one time. Um, as far as whether or not our product is considered processed, I really think it depends on who you ask. If you ask the FDA or the EU, frozen, being frozen whole is a process. If you ask the FDA, it is not necessarily a, a process. Process. Follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just wondering whether we need to define process because my sense is that, that that we should not be counting frozen boxed herring uh, that the, that we have to empty that hole every time it comes in. That they ought to be able to carry that stuff around because that's they're not going to dump frozen boxes of herring over the side. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we share the same sentiments. Um, David. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to go back to uh, option C with the uh, GSI 30 based uh, forecast system. Just again, for a clarification, some good questions were also asked, and my interpretation is a bit different from the explanation that was given, I think. Uh, when we talk about the three fishery dependent or independent samples, each containing at least 25 female herring in the appropriate uh, gonadal stages, three through five, through four, through five that is. My understanding is that every sample is 100 fish, but of the 100 fish, you've got to have at least 25 female herring. Uh, not just picking 25 fish. It's, it, you've got because you can get a sample with juveniles, juveniles and adults. So that's my interpretation that it's still 100 fish, but within that sample of 100 fish, you've got to have 25 female herring in that spawning condition. Otherwise, the sample is not going to be used for GSI uh, forecasting. So that's my interpretation, and I just ask whether or not it's correct. Renee. So one thing to keep in mind on the forecasting system is that we're no longer looking for a percentage of spawn fish. What we're looking for is we're looking for GSI values from those females in order to create a linear relationship to predict the spawning closure date. So it's a very different sampling protocol, therefore we're not reliant on 
the percentage of females within a sample or percentage of females at a certain GSI value. We're looking to see what those females are doing right now so that we can put a dot on a graph and then create more data and create a linear relationship that leads us to a date. Good. Thank, for, yeah, thank you for that clarification. Uh, I had misunderstood. Now it's, uh, now it's clear. Uh, the technical committee has done a very good job responding to our initial concerns and in the direction we gave them a while ago. Um, I like what they presented. It makes a great deal of sense. And when with this particular clarification, you know, I'm very comfortable with uh, what has been provided as, as, as options within this document. Okay, before we go to the AP report, are, are there any further questions for either Ashton or Renee? Seeing none, um, turn over to Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the section. Uh, this uh, report is in the supplemental materials. Uh, we had a conference call last Friday, and uh, this uh, summary uh, was uh, created by Ashton and I, and we had ample opportunity for the uh, AP members to respond to this draft, and, and uh, I think it represents a, a, a good uh, summary of, of that call, which was uh, detailed. So for that reason, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read through this so I don't miss anything. Uh, we had uh, nine of 16 advisors um, on the phone call, and Mr. Paquette uh, is, is the only advisor here, I think, other than myself today. He's in the audience. So, uh, so we met on the Friday call um, in advance of, of this morning's activity at the section. Uh, prior to considering the discussion document, an advisor voiced concern that the document provides no biological analysis or socioeconomic analysis so that weighing some of the spawning closure options becomes difficult. The January 2015 TC report was mentioned as helpful relative to better understanding the forecasting system being recommended, but the AP generally had remaining questions about how the system would work. It was also noted that the problem statement should include a discussion of the current status of Atlantic herring spawning stock status and the Table 3 and Figure 2 of the Council's 2016 to 2018 specifications document could be included to provide this information. Some advisors suggested that any additional spawning protection in the Gulf of Maine should be tied to spawning stock status coastwide since extending the Gulf of Maine closure period for an additional two weeks would have significant economic impacts on herring fishermen and the lobster fishery where bait demand is high during the late summer and fall period. Relative to issue one, spawning area efficiency, efficacy, excuse me, uh, there was consensus in support of option C, the GSI 30 based forecast system. Advisors supported the forecast system's likely ability to better target closures to periods of time when the majority of fish are spawning. Advanced warning prior to a closure was voiced as a positive, which is provided by the forecasting systems announcing closures five days before the forecasted date. Advisors voiced concern about the fact that last week's opening, this was two weeks ago now, I guess, and reclosing of the Mass New Hampshire spawning area all took place within 24 hours, which caused significant disruption to the fishery. Some advisors suggested that much of the fish in that area had already spawned and that the weather was better than it had been for a month. Advisors commented that the goal of this program should not be to save every spawning herring, particularly given the coastal spawning stock condition today. Advisors also supported this option as it requires that projections would be based on a minimum of three samples. One advisor supported the status quo option A. The AP asked the technical committee why the forecasting system standardized for larger fish, 30 centimeter fish, when the current GSI is based on fish under 28 inches. Uh, there was no consensus relative to which of the three GSI 30 trigger value options should be chosen, and I believe it's because nobody understood how they were going to work. Uh, relative to the default closure dates, as noted above, the AP could not come to a consensus on the appropriate GSI 30 trigger value due to uncertainty of the outcome. 
Five people felt the 70th percentile trigger value would provide additional protection, so fishing just prior to spawning would not happen. One person was opposed to the 70th percentile option. They felt the fishery would have to stay closed longer to accommodate maturing fish and spawners. So the AP asked, how do each of the percentile triggers compare or relate to the status quo approach? On the spawning area boundaries, there was a general consensus in support of option A status quo, which has the effect of maintaining the three spawning areas. The AP voiced concern and reluctance to combine the western Maine and Massachusetts New Hampshire spawning areas. Advisors felt option B would likely result in a large coastal shutdown based on a few samples. In addition, the AP felt there was not significant or sufficient biological evidence to support anything other than the status quo. The AP suggested that a chart depicting the spawning area boundaries would be helpful for the public and that the document should also reflect fishing effort in these areas over time. The National Marine Fisheries Service should be able to supply VMS data to accomplish this. Relative to the spawning closure period, there were seven advisors in support of the status quo, option A, a four-week closure with the fishery being closed closed for an additional two weeks if necessary, and three in favor of option B, a six-week closure. A participant commented they were not entirely in favor of a six-week closure, but it was better than the status quo given the potential damage, i.e. fishing on spawners that one herring boat can impose in just a couple of days. A participant in favor of status quo commented that there's not enough social and economic data to justify a six-week closure, and the document should outline the effects of could potentially have on lobster fishing. Relative to the reclosure protocol, three advisors were in favor of the status quo and two participants were in favor of option B, the defined protocol. Those in favor of option B liked that it only involved one sample to initiate the reclosure, which is why other advisors opposed it. On the fixed gear set aside provision adjustment, the AP was unanimously in favor of the status quo, option A, and the AP asked that the document include historical landings in the fixed gear fishery. I think I saw a chart on that just a minute ago, um, which we had not seen prior to the call. Um, and this, we felt this information should be available in the council specifications document, which is, I think, where you found that table. On the empty fish hold provision, there was general support for an empty fish hold provision in the fishery, and the issue has been addressed by the council. Five advisors were in favor of option E, an empty fish hold provision limiting the requirements to vessels with the ability to pump fish that's not contingent on federal adoption. And two participants were in favor of option B, an empty fish hold provision with the pumping limitation that is contingent upon federal adoption of the same provision. Mr. Chairman, point of information, please. Pat. Uh, I'm concerned that we're having an assessment of a draft uh, amendment that's been put together hasn't even been put out there for the public yet. And I think uh, all the things you are saying, Jeff, are very pertinent to the issues, but we're here to talk about what should be in the draft addendum, amendment, whatever it is. And I'm a little concerned about the details here. So I did read the report, and I most of the options I would have agreed to uh, that you have selected, but I, I'm not sure this is the appropriate time that we should be picking and selecting which ones any group would particularly like. In this particular case, the advisory panel. I hope I'm not out of order, Mr. Chairman. Um, so with that information, I'd like to turn it back to you. Yeah, thank you for that observation, Pat. I mean, it, it, Jeff is just relaying the substance of the AP call. I mean, they, they it's consistent with a previous uh, meeting that they had prior, and they were reacting to the information they had in hand. Um, I think, you know, following following his uh, report, when he's getting close to the end, you know, we'll ask him for any questions, and then determine, this section will determine whether or not they want to send the, uh, the draft document out for public comment, either as it is or with any modifications. Okay, uh, another point, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess my concern is that um, I had several comments from some of our fishermen, and I felt at this particular point in time we were just talking about what option do we want to include. And um, again, back to the um, one or two points that uh, Jeff made, um, one that stood out in my mind was do we want to make a recommendation to change the option for closures? Um, the rest of it, again, it's, I think it's just information that if I were allowed to present what our fishermen want, and I think, I'm not sure how many options we would change. I just think an advisory panel should not be making um, 
their positions known at this particular point in time other than they would like to have in the document this option versus that option. I understand the rationale, but, but again, uh, I thought the board's role was primarily to identify which options were appropriate to go out to the public. So maybe I stand corrected, Mr. Chairman, but that's my humble opinion. I duly noted, but I have full confidence in this section being able to filter the AP's comments and determine what's appropriate for, for going out for public comment. And, and as we all know, we will review this again uh, at least once more. So why don't you conclude your report, Jeff? Yeah, I have to say I don't understand the objection, but um, I will continue with the report because I thought we were supposed to provide advice on what was in the document, and that's precisely what the AP did. However, uh, in other comments, um, the AP discussed the benefit of reinstating a tolerance for spawning fish in the fishery because it would provide the opportunity to regularly collect samples of herring for GSI analysis from vessels that are working in the area to be closed. The majority of AP members requested the section consider adding a tolerance option to draft amendment three. One advisor did not support the suggestion. The advisors suggested that information relative to current status of the fishery, as was mentioned earlier, be added to the document. And the participants said they were confused about the goals and objectives of the draft amendment and that there should be text added to the document that describes that spawning, protecting spawning fish is a goal in addition to maintaining the fishery and markets. Protecting spawning fish exclusively is unrealistic. One participant noted that although the herring, the spawning stock biomass is above the target, there's still the need to update the spawn enclosure system. The spawn enclosure system is necessary irrespective of the status of the stock. Uh, the chair suggested the AP be polled to see who would like to continue being an AP member and repopulate the AP if necessary. <coughs> Only nine of 16 members participated in the call, which ended at noon. Thank you, Jeff, for your report. Are there questions for Jeff? Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, two questions, Jeff. Um, first, you said uh, an industry member reported that there was not a lot of spawn herring caught when, when it opened. So that's one question. Is, is that uh, what that industry member said? And, and does that reflect your knowledge of what was caught when, when it opened? And secondly, uh, the concern about socioeconomic uh, impact, was that socioeconomic impact to the herring fishery or to the lobster industry? Because uh, I would think that this, the delaying a week uh, would not affect uh, the herring industry in that the quota, they would then catch the quota. So it's not like they're missing out on quota, it's just being delayed when they harvest it. So those would be my two questions. Thank you. Jeff. On well, the second one, I think the overarching concern was a standard six-week closure and the potential to displace the fishery for an additional uh, couple of weeks if another two weeks was added onto it. I think there was some confusion as to whether or not the uh, it'd be a six weeks plus two or, or just a straight up six weeks because, of course, the western Gulf of Maine or the, the New Hampshire um, Massachusetts closure did go six weeks this year, so the, you know, there wouldn't be any real effect there. Um, uh, people were just concerned about the displacement of the fishery later and later into the fall, and and I think there was interest in having socioeconomic information in here about the potential for an extension of the spawning closures, not only to the herring fishery, but, but also to the lobster fishery, because it's such an important time of year. So I think we were told that the uh, Commission's social science and economic uh, committee, whatever you guys call it, uh, didn't have any information to provide up. So that's where we are on that one. Um, as far as what was taking place uh, when the uh, area opened a couple of weeks ago, our boats had had had, had spent fish. That's what we caught. And and when I talked to Brad Schondelmeyer about this a couple of days ago, just to kind of see what they were seeing with their shoreside monitoring program, they said they saw fish going off at three different places and three, the, the, the condition of the spawning fish differed in three different places within that closed area. And then there was some discussion that was not reflected in the report about the potential to split those areas, which was an option that was being talked about with this amendment, you know, some time ago. So, so that was what uh, was reported, that, that the boats were catching 
fish that had already uh, spawned during the time that the extension was was uh, was was created. So we went to six weeks. So, um, so that that's, there was a lot of concern about that, but. It is what it is, and, and now, of course, it's closed and reopened again, and, and those fish were protected. So thank you uh, for the questions. Other questions for Jeff? Emerson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Jeff, uh, for your report. So um, I know the AP had, you know, comments on the, on the various um, options, uh, but was there any consensus that came out of the AP meeting about additional options to include? Uh, we thought we had consensus on the uh, going back to the tolerance, but one one uh, advisor uh, emailed Ashton after the call and said they didn't agree with that. So I, I don't think there is anything specific that we'd like to add, or the AP is suggesting be added to the document. Other than that, uh, you know, other than the consideration of reimporting the the tolerance, which I'm sure will be con would be controversial as it has been for a long time, but the discussion was really just about about trying to, as much as possible, focus on when those areas should be closed. And that's why they supported the 30% GSI approach, the forecasting approach that the, that the uh, PDT has come up with, uh, or the technical committee, rather. So no, I don't think there were anything specific uh, where there was consensus to add anything to the document. Thank you, that I remember it. Question, Pat? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Je uh, Mr. Chairman. Jeff, I wasn't trying to done what you were saying. I appreciate that, all the information put on the table. Uh, you didn't say anything more specific about the um, options for closing or opening. The two options we had was either four weeks or six weeks, and I don't think there's any flexibility in there. Uh, but from what you said, you said it could vary. Could it be beyond six? Do we want to put another option in there to allow more flexibility than four weeks or six weeks? I think that uh, the majority of the advisors were supporting the status quo, the four weeks plus two if necessary, with the addition of the forecasting ability that, that's been developed, this 30% GSI forecasting thing. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, thank you, Pat. Adam. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, while there were certainly some very uh, loose comments about the document as a whole, certainly focused on the specific options, will the AP be getting together again to discuss these options again prior to our decision making, presumably at the next meeting, or would this constitute that input from them moving forward? So the AP would meet following the public comment period. I'd present a kind of summary of the public comments that I've received and then ask them for um, their input based on that prior to the next meeting. Are there any further questions on the AP report? Seeing none, we're down to considering whether or not this is ready for prime time. Uh, what's the sense of the section? Are we ready to send the draft amendment three out for public comment? Tony. Terry, and I just want to make sure everybody's clear on how, what the document will look like when it goes out for public comment, since this is a little bit different than how our documents normally look when we have an amendment. Um, uh, what we have presented to the section is um, just the management changes that we are considering in, in this document. So it's not a full, the full amendment as it would be approved um, and considered for final action in February. Uh, due to time constraints and working on issues, we weren't able to take all of the um, management measures that would just carry over from Amendment 2 and its um, agenda. And so Ashton would work on that over the fall and winter to include all the, just the carryover measures and include that in the meeting materials with the options that went out for public comment. So those options that we're actually making changes to. Um, and then the, the habitat section, et cetera, would also be included at that point. 
Yeah, thanks, Tony. Is everyone clear? Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in other words, Tony, um, you'll be coming, filling this in and coming back before we, um, we go to public hearing. No, the document will be abbreviated for a public hearing, so it'll only be the options that we're considering changes to for the hearings, and then when the board considers final action in February on those options, we will also have all the carryover measures um, from Amendment 2, so the measures that we're not proposing any changes to. So what's going to happen between now and February? If the section approves this document for public comment, then we will take just the options that we're considering management changes to out for public comment. So it's an abbreviated version of the document. And those would then be embedded into a, a final document for, the, for this section's vote. Steve? Just for a little clarification, so would then that, that the complete document include some of the, the uh, things the AP noted were missing, like uh, economic analysis, biological information, objectives? To the extent that we have the information available to us, we can do that, but uh, there is not a lot of that social economic information that is simple and readily available for us to include in the document. And the CES has said to us that they can't provide the majority of the information. We did include some positive, negative, neutral indicators, or we will be including those, and it's what you all saw um, back in May, so it's not any different than the social economics that the um, AP had already seen before. Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I make a motion, uh, so are we adding anything to the document as it was presented, or are we deleting anything from the document as we discussed it today? I mean, that would be up to the section. If, if when a motion goes up on the board, um, then I would, would expect the uh, specific section members, if they would want, want to modify the um, a motion to consider, to, to, um, to, to send drafted denim th amendment three out for public comment, either as it stands or as it's modified. I'll make it easy, Mr. Chairman. I move that we, um, we approve the draft amendment three for public. For, for public comment, is there a second to the motion? Second by Richie White. Discussion on the motion, Doug. Well, it's also discussion on uh, the point that Terry, I mean that uh, Tony was making about this. In May, we approved a document that had a framework, an amendment that had you know status of the fishery, status of the stock. Has a whole the, the whole laundry list of things that we include in uh, a full amendment. But what I understand is, instead of pulling out what we originally had and then putting in this and the options, we're not even going to, when we go out to public hearing, we're not going to give the full document at all. We're just going to be uh, giving these options. Um, but so I guess I don't understand. This is just really one section. It's fisheries management options, and why couldn't we just pull it out and insert it? You know what we originally had in May, and then insert this in, so that the public knows what the full document is that we're bringing out. Even though this is the the meat of it, really. Tony or Ashton, can you respond to Doug, please? What was presented in May doesn't have some of the other parts as well. We can use what was presented in May for the fishery description, et cetera, but I think that there's some still some pieces that are missing from that fishery description, et cetera, especially, and then that also did not have the carryover measures from Amendment 2. So we want to make sure that that information does get into a final document so that we have one comprehensive document 
document that you can go to for herring measures. So when you open up Amendment 3, it'll be all of the herring measures that the Commission has on its books. So we can include some of those fishery description information and some of the habitat information that we had before, but knowing that we may alter that description a little bit to make sure that it's correct and updated um, at fe in February. That's the only thing that we're worried about, that it doesn't have all of the most up-to-date information in it. For the comment, talk. So my question then is, what if we were to wait until we had a full document, excuse me for being, um, and we went out to public hearing in May, I mean between February and, and May, that would essentially delay any changes for another fishing year, correct? So we're going forward with a, a document that, you know, depending on how the board feels that we have options that are fully fleshed out, but not a full document that's fleshed out in an amendment. And so I'm having a little bit of trouble reconciling that and deciding whether it's important to get these new, new you know, potentially some new measures in, depending on how the uh, board uh, votes on it or whether we should um, delay it for another meeting, unfortunately. Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My point exactly, Doug. I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to put out an incomplete document or a document that's going to mislead the public again. And so the real question I think that has to be answered is what harm if we delay until May uh, and then have it affect the following year? Now, if there's major harm to the fishery and we should press forward, then um, I would support uh, what Doug suggested, getting the other, other information in the document to go out to public. <laughs> Excuse me. So can you help me with that, Mr. Chairman? Well, I'm certainly not going to address what the harm may or may not be. Um, but, but I will um, recognize David Paris in, in the in continued section discussion. Uh, well, I approve of the motion. I think we should support it. I'm satisfied with what's in the draft amendment uh, as it now stands. I think the options are well laid out. Good work done by staff and the technical committee. If we p postpone taking action on this document, in other words, if we said we'll hold on, we'll wait till it's entirely completed, we'll look at it again, then we bring it out to public hearing. If we do that, um, I'm quite confident that I'll be in a very difficult position trying to get new regulations in place for the next fall fishing season. Uh, there's a new regulatory process in Massachusetts that uh, requires a lot more review. So the sooner we do this, the sooner we go out to public hearing and we make our decisions about what needs to be done, potential changes, and the better off I'm going to be in getting it implemented for 2016. So as a follow-up to that, Pat, I mean, are, are we doing harm to the stock? I, I, I can't answer that question, but are, are we doing uh, uh, harm to, to, to the individual states, Maine, New Hampshire's, and uh, the Massachusetts uh, um, rulemaking process? Yeah, you, we would be unable to, to move any of these alternatives forward in the next fishing year. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Chairman. And by all means, I think we should move forward. Um, and what Mr. Um, Grout said about um, adding to this document, uh, Tony followed up by saying she could draw out of the previous document um, enough information that would beef this up to offer um, some substance in addition to what we already have. Could we draw the two of those together without overburdening the staff so that the document that goes, does, go out, does go out is a much more complete document? I mean, I guess the, the question up here, uh, Pat, are you, are you talking for about inclusion of socioeconomic analysis and all the other uh, the issues of substance that we're going to have in the final version? What we have available that we could succinctly pull out of that document without overburdening the staff, so it's still a meaningful document. Could we say in it, refer to, refer to, as opposed to 
typing the whole thing in and presenting a, a document that's a monster. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to fathom that the staff would put out an unmeaningful document. Uh, I'm not, don't be offended. I, you know, I offend everybody. I love to. But um, the, the point I'm making is if we have doc information that we can carry over and add to this, I think we should. I mean, my sense is the document will be as inclusive as as it's you know possible, given given where we are in the process and the ability of staff to to get something out in order to have the public hearings. Should that be the will of the section in the vote, that will be sometime between now and lunch. Richie. Okay. If there's no further discussion, I make a make a motion to. Nope. We've got a question. couple more hands. I've got Richie and, and Emerson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> In the beginning of this discussion, it, it, um, I had concern about having a document that went out that wasn't 100% complete. <clears throat> but it, seeing that uh, it would delay a year of implementing new regulations, uh, I now support going forward with this. Um, <clears throat> I think what happened this year uh, clearly shows that we need <clears throat> new regulations. Um, it, it was very upsetting to me that uh, we opened uh, the fishery, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1A uh, while spawning was occurring uh, when we had uh, tests showing that uh, even though the regulations allowed it to open, um, it, it clearly would have been uh, the conservative and concern for the resource to delay a week and get more samples. As a result, there was a, a substantial amount of spawn herring caught. Um, I guess it's not totally clear how much, but certainly in the millions of pounds. And I think we have to make sure that that does not happen in the future. And I think adopting some of the regulations that are out there um, would help to accomplish that. So. I am going to support uh, my second and uh, to go forward with this. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm a little confused on process here. Um, I'm wondering why we're going out with an amendment in a form that's different than other amendments that, that we've done and that we do. And what I'm hearing is that, well, we need to move this along so we can take care of it before the next fishing year. But when we started this, or after we started this amendment, we decided to delay it for a while we withdrew it so I'm wondering why if if a couple of months ago we were in a rush to get this done why are we in a rush to get it done now and why are we going forward with a, a format that's different than what we normally use Tony it was we didn't know that the document didn't have all of the old stuff until we dug into it because of the transition that went that happened on the staff level. So it was unclear that there it was missing these sections that we normally would put in there. I can't speak to the sections will to move the document now versus the not its will to not move the document previously. But um, and we just wanted to make sure that the section was okay with not having those other pieces available. We have in the past not had all of the old um, carryover measures in amendments before, but we've gotten direction from boards and sections that we want to have complete um, documents when we do amendments, so we're trying to make sure that we do that um, moving forward, and so we just wanted to make sure that the section was clear that what you see in February will look a little bit different. The options themselves won't look any different for what we're considering for management. I think for the public it might be easier for them to comment on those options because they'll be just standalone for what we're actually trying to change. Um, and we will make sure that we include at least a brief history of the fishery. Amendments usually have a lot more background information in them. Sometimes we get information from the public that that can be confusing because there's so much information in there. So we try to distill it down to its simplest form when we're actually doing the presentation at the hearings. So the document will 
will be distilled down into its simplest form and then the full document will come in February. So you'll still get a general gist. Adam. Is an accurate description of the document that we expect to see forthcoming the document that we approved in May with section 4.2, which was the commercial fisheries replaced with what we're seeing here today? Is that, is that an accurate description of what we're essentially voting on with this motion? Y yes. Doug? One more question, if I could potentially put our GARFO representative, Mike Petney, on the spot while he's uh, sitting there looking at his black, no. <laughs> uh, we've, one uh, aspect of this amendment um, is the, is a uh, item that is in framework adjustment for, we've had public comment period is, has ended on that. Do you have any uh, um, time frame and when the uh, regional office plans to make a decision on uh, framework for? Unfortunately, no, I do not. I, I wish I could share that with you, but. Is there further discussion to the motion on the board? Joe, you want me to read it? Oh, no. Yeah, fine. Okay, let's, uh, let's have a caucus. Okay, is there, um, is everyone ready? Chairman, Pat. point of clarification, is it possible, uh, based on the comment that Mr. Nowalski made, that this is actually only replacing uh, Section 4.2? It, it, and that's what it sounds like, that what we're doing in this amendment is we are replacing 4.2. And I just need that for clarification. And if it's true and the rest of it remains the same, can we not include that in it? Will it make a difference or is it inferred? I just want to be clear on the record because I don't, we have concern in our contingency here that it, it isn't clear. Ashton or Tony, I mean, I, I mean, it's clear to me, but I, I'm going to, if it's not clear to you, then we have a problem. No, as, I'm sorry, only, only for reference purposes. I, I don't believe there's going to be any other changes, are there? No, sorry for the confusion. It was just meant to say that the options that we presented in Section 4.2 previously, these options revise those specific options. However, it doesn't revise that we're going to move forward with that document as it was. Okay, then that's good. Hold on one second, please. I'm okay with that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you for the question, Pat. Um, those support the motion on the board, please indicate so. And those opposed? And those abstaining? Who didn't vote? Where's Connecticut? Uh, okay, well, the, um, the motion carries five to one. So we will send this document out for public comment. Um, uh, states are gonna, who are gonna want public hearings, please contact Ashton. Is there any other business to come before the section today? Seeing none, uh, consider this meeting adjourned.